All right, NFL fans, welcome back to another Fans First Football Show. I am Jeff Hartman. Joining me always is Rob Sasker. No, no, no Victory Monday shirts from either of us this week. Uh, Rob, how's it going? Uh, it's terrible right now. My team is going to go a calendar month without a win. It stinks, Jeff. Thanks for asking. It does suck. And hey, the Steelers suck too. So we're, this is not going to be a giant suck fest of a podcast. We're going to talk about every single game that took place on Sunday. That's what we always do. Uh, make sure that if maybe if you're checking this out on YouTube and you don't know, check out our FFSN NFL feed, wherever you get your podcast, simply by searching FFSN NFL. We do appreciate all the support. Let's get this thing started with the one o'clock games. And I'll tell you what, a game that surprised the heck out of me was the Tennessee Titans and Atlanta Falcons. No, a final score, 28-23, but holy cow, DeAndre Hopkins. Talk about a resurgence. Four touchdown passes thrown by the rookie, the, the Hellman's mayonnaise guy. I mean, <laughs> I, know, I know you're a mayonnaise guy. Oh. Rob, what did you think about this game for the Tennessee Titans? I just love that Will Levis got in there and he was like, you know what? I'm just going to chuck this thing down the field and just go bombs away on this team. And if you go and look at like the next gen passing chart, he's got one, two, let's see, six, eight passes, 40 yards down the field, yeah, eight passes. And oh, by the way, he just so happened to complete three of those for touchdowns. Like he just let it fly and good for him and good for Tennessee. Like there is life outside of Ryan Tannehill, you know, like you don't have to, that doesn't have to be how you guys play offense. Good for Will Levis. Good for Tennessee. And, you know, maybe we thought Tennessee might sell off some of their pieces, the trade deadlines tomorrow. And maybe now they don't. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't, there's something about a guy that gets in a game and says, you know what? F it. Like I've, <laughs> I've got Deandre Hopkins. I'm just going to chuck the thing deep. Like, I, got, I got a big arm. He's always had the arm strength. That was a big, uh, Yes. Check box on the, uh, for him coming into the draft. Hey, let's just screw it. Let's throw it deep. And he did it to success. They win 28, 23. They're going to be have a short week this week as they play the Steelers on Thursday night football. The Atlanta Falcons continue to stumble. I've said it a million times. We've talked about it at four and four. It just, you wonder, is anyone going to win the NFC South? <laughs> what is this even going to look like? Yeah. I mean, the, with the division, the whole division stinks the falcons are less than the sum of their parts which is so so sad there's another team where it's like get out of this desmond ritter taylor heineke like no yeah stop it with this like go find somebody what maybe they have the yolo approach like will levis did but whatever but just like it, it can be better than this it doesn't have to be this hard on offense Exactly. So, all right, let's go to the, the Battle of New York, even though it's in New Jersey. That would be the Jets and Giants playing at MetLife Stadium. Some would call it a barn burner. Went to overtime. Final score, Jets win 13-10. to 10. Tyrod Taylor leaves with an injury. Uh, the Giants, they, they're struggling, obviously. The Jets are not really setting the world on fire. You know what's weird is when you have a game like this and the, the most talked about storyline following the game is that – Aaron Rodgers is throwing footballs pregame and looks like he's healthy. Like that's what everyone's talking about. No one's talking about the game, but the jets do find a way to win and they're staying alive four and three. Now they're remaining afloat in a very competitive AFC East. What are your thoughts, Rob? Uh, prisons should have been sentenced to watch the uh, prisoners. I should say should have been sentenced to watch this football game. 15 punts in the first half in the first half. It's <laughs> insanity. And I talk about it every week with the 49ers, and I talk about it every week with other teams as well. Fourth down decision-making in the NFL stinks. And Brian Dayball absolutely peed down his leg in a big spot in this one. The Giants are up 10-7. to seven. It's fourth and one at the Jets' 17-yard line. And the, there's 28 seconds left left in the football game 28 seconds and brian dayball says we're gonna try a 35 yard field goal to go up 13 to 7 keep in mind graham gano not healthy in the game has a knee injury and had already missed earlier in the game but brian dayball instead of just picking up a yard right giving the ball to saquon barkley sneaking the ball quarterback sneak one freaking yard he says, no, we're going to try and kick a field goal. Graham Gano misses the field goal. And remember, when you miss a field goal, the other team takes over from the spot of the kick, not from the line of scrimmage. 
So the Jets get the ball back at their 25-yard line, go down the field, tie up the game at the end of regulation, and then eventually win in overtime. Brian Dayball, just pick up a yard. Just pick up a yard. What are you doing? <laughs> we talk about it every week, man. It's yes. literally a an on. It's like an ongoing joke. Like some of these decisions, you get the uber aggressive. Uh, Staley's in Los Angeles with the Chargers, but then you also have the uber conservative nature of some of these coaches. There is no rhyme or reason with some of these. And that's that's what's truly concerning from a football fan's perspective is that there is no rhyme or reason. Like you have these conservative coaches that will never break the trend. They will never go for it, Rob. And then you have the guys that are so into the gusto that they're, they're going to go for it no matter what. Like you're sitting there thinking, this is the dumbest decision ever punt the ball away, and they can say, no, because I go for it on fourth down. There's got to be a middle ground, isn't there? There could be a middle ground, but I just, I think the people have not gotten over the fact that, well, if you do the conventional thing and fail, nobody criticizes for you for it. But if you do the unconventional thing and fail, then you get hammered. Like, Brian Dayball is going to get a little criticism but if he had gone for it on fourth down and they didn't get it, he would get so much more criticism. Oh, it's yeah. only a 35 yard field goal. You got your backup, backup quarterback in there. And I think that they are, coaches are so risk averse. They're so risk averse that it's going to take a really, really long time. It's starting to, but I think it's going to take even longer for that to really kind of fade. So the Jets find a way to win 13 to 10 in overtime. And like I said, they remain afloat in the AFC East and another game in the AFC East, which is very important. A divisional matchup between the New England Patriots and the Miami Dolphins. The Dolphins end up winning this one 31 to 17 Miami. Again, though, what has been the trend with the Miami Dolphins so far this year? Six and two. The two losses have been to good football teams. They just... It, it, it's so weird. Like what is going on right now with this team? I don't know. The new England Patriots are bad. They're two and six. <laughs> They're struggling. Uh, that's, but this was actually close at halftime. Rob, what were your takeaways from this game? Yeah, I think Miami has proven they can dismantle teams that don't have their stuff together. And yeah. when they play a team that does that, they look like a totally different franchise. This one, like you said, it wasn't a blowout right out of the gate. Like new England was kind of hanging around, but they just couldn't get over the hump. They just, they don't have the, like, just look at the, the contrast in weapons, right? Miami has Tyree kill and Jalen Waddle and Raheem Moster and all these good players. And then, and the Patriots on the other side have like Kendrick Bourne. <laughs> like, Ezekiel what? Elliott, Ezekiel like, Elliott, ghost of Ezekiel <laughs> Elliott. Like, no, they just, the Patriots just do not have the weapons to compete with a team like Miami. And yeah, like, Credit to Miami. You won. You beat the teams you're supposed to beat. That's that's good. That is a, a step on the path to building a championship team. But you have to show me, at least for me, you have to show me you can beat a good team. And I feel like they haven't really done that so far this year. Yeah, the Dolphins, I, like I said, it's kind of their MO right now. And when you look at their schedule coming up, well, they have an opportunity. They're going to play the Chiefs next week. And that's going to be overseas. I think that's in Frankfurt, yes. yep. uh, if I recall. and then. Eh, a couple duds coming up. Is it really the, the big test is going to be next week for them until they play the Cowboys and Ravens towards and the Bills towards the end of the season. But the Dolphins, their their schedule is definitely more conducive to them actually seeing success. But they do the they do the thing. They beat the Patriots. The Patriots aren't that good. And we've talked about that at length. So the Dolphins win 31 to 17 and continue their dominance over mediocre teams. Let's talk about a mediocre team. And that's my Pittsburgh Steelers. I would yeah. say they are about as middle of the pack as it gets. They lose the Jacksonville Jaguars 20 to 10 in I, we talk about officiating on this show before one of the oddest, like the, the officiating in this game was just, Oh man, like there were some really questionable calls for both teams, not just against the Steelers, but the Jaguars find a way to win. Trevor Lawrence makes enough plays. Steelers make no plays. They go the entire first <laughs> quarter without having a first down. Like they oh. don't even get a first down in an entire quarter. Rob, I kid you not, my daughters are down here because they're getting interested in football and and one's 12 and one's 10 and they're watching every second. I feel bad for those kids. Like, I feel <laughs> bad that they have to watch the, this team. It's boring as hell. I, I grew up in the 90s when the Steelers weren't even that great. Yeah, they made it to Super Bowl 30 and lost, but at least we had Cordell Stewart, who was a whole lot of fun to watch. Like yeah. He was entertaining. There's nothing entertaining about this team outside of TJ Watt. This team is... is Boy, did he get bit by an injury bug at the wrong time. Kenny Pickett leaves with a rib injury. Minka Fitzpatrick pulls a hamstring. He's probably out on Thursday night. 
it's bad. It's really bad in Pittsburgh, Rob. What's what? What is it from an outsider's perspective? <laughs> it is amazing to me that the Steelers. You could make an argument that the Steelers, when they had Antonio Brown and Ben Roethlisberger and Le'Veon Bell, had one of the best offensive skill player like you know weapons of all time. They were at yeah. that level that was just unbelievable. Yep. And now it's the complete opposite of that there's just nothing there there's nothing scary you mentioned the officiating the Steelers got called for an offensive offsides on a field goal attempt which later your kicker is posting on Instagram pictures that they're not actually not only are they not offsides but the, the Jags are lined up in the neutral zone I mean so the the officiating wasn't good now Kenny Pickett is hurt so you're you're back with Mitchell Trubisky it's Shoot just me now Minka Fitzpatrick, hamstring injury. He's hurt. That guy is always banged up. There just doesn't seem to be a lot of hope right now for the Steelers. And it's frustrating. And they're four and three. And Mike Tomlin, you know, he'll probably go like nine and eight, something like that. And everybody will give him praise for, for not being under 500. And you're just having another one of these years in Pittsburgh. There's a reason why people call him mediocre Mike, because we celebrate mediocrity. Right. And, there's there's also a, a large group of fans that think that Mason Rudolph should start the game on Thursday night because they feel like they've seen enough for Mitch Trubisky. Think about that. You'd rather see Mason Rudolph. <laughs> I know. I would agree on Mitch Trubisky. Like, I don't know why people thought that that we were going to get some sort of different Mitchell Trubisky because he had a couple of good preseason games. Like, what? Yeah. No, we yeah, know no. what he is. No, it's not good. The Steelers are struggling, and it's one of those situations where the, the the Steelers fan base is just at their wit's end. I mean, a lot of the attention now is going towards Tomlin because he brought in Matt Canada. He kept Matt. They they kept Matt Canada. It's the offense is just it's just awful. It reminds me of the movie The Polar Express when the kid looks up the North Pole definition. It says devoid of life. That's the Steelers' <laughs> offense right now. This is devoid of life. There's nothing. It's nothing. And not Kenny Pickett is not the guy right now, whether that's the offense or not. It's bad. It's bad. But you know what? The Jaguars are also a very, hey, they've won five in a row. They've won five games in a row. Some of them overseas. They beat teams like the Bills. They go into Pittsburgh. That's not an easy place to play. The conditions were not good. It was raining. It was wet. Trevor Lawrence and the guys get it done. So I do want to give them some props as well. Yeah, they were. I mean, Jacksonville is 13 and four over their last 17 games. That's pretty yeah. damn impressive. When I read that afterwards, I was like, wow, really? Because for me, I feel like the Jags have been kind of up and down this year, but they're six and two, six and two, four and oh on the road, which is impressive. Doug Peterson is a good coach. This is not, you know, the, the Jags that we've seen with sometimes they just have this kind of meh coaching staff yeah. and organization like no Doug Peterson knows what he's doing and the Jags are six and two and they do deserve credit he's he's got them buttoned up we'll put it that way let's go to another game though this is the battle of the rookie quarterbacks CJ Stroud versus Bryce Young didn't see this one coming the Panthers win what a wild final score this was 15 to 13 you don't see a lot of 15 to 13 final scores in the NFL nonetheless Bryce Young was really excited after the game he saw the locker room as he came in after the game it was just there's a lot of pressure there. You want, you want to play better. You want to beat that guy that was drafted after you that everyone's talking about. Hey, CJ Stroud was the best quarterback in the draft. Find a way to win. Panthers get their first win. I feel like this was just a gut punch for a Texans team that was really starting to play well. They were really starting to turn heads, thinking that they could compete in the AFC South. Maybe not so much. What do you think? I completely agree. I I have a soft spot for D'Amico Ryans because he was the 49ers defensive coordinator for the past couple seasons. So I'm kind of rooting for him. And you thought like, hey, the Texans are, you know, they're kind of piecing it together. But this is a very young team. Clearly, you know, they're they're in the first year of this building period here. You can't lose to the Panthers, the winless no. Panthers. You can't do it. And it just, you know, it shows the inexperience and the immaturity that they have. That's the word I'm searching for, immaturity. The end of this game was weird. So the Panthers are trying to kick a field goal to take the lead. There's three seconds left. First, they try to kick the field goal, and Houston's off sides, and there's unnecessary roughness because the guy crashes into the holder. So then they have to kick it again, and then Houston is off sides again <laughs> on the kick, even though it goes in, but because he was unabated to the kicker, they have to call the play dead. 
So then the Panthers had to kick it a third time. And then they finally do. And it was kind of setting up for like, oh, no, is this winless team going to have to kick three field goals and maybe miss one? And then they remain winless. But kick one in for the Panthers. Credit to uh, Pinheiro with the kick. And uh, they get their first win, which I'm glad about. I don't ever want to see anybody go winless. Like, this game is hard. The players and the coaches work hard. Give everybody at least one win. Do the Detroit Lions pop champagne like the Dolphins do? The seventy-two Dolphins on the team finally wins, and they oh, we're winless. So I guess, but then the Browns. Yep. The, the Browns finished winless too, so maybe they pop champagne. I don't know. That was a you talk about a tough game to watch with the Jets and Giants. This one was another one. This is a tough game. Yes. Just didn't seem like anyone wanted to win, even at that last sequence that you just read. <laughs> Three kicks Wild. in a row. Uh, a, a game that was, hey, hopefully you hammered the over, the Rams and Cowboys. Cowboys put up 43 points over the Los Angeles Rams. They come off their bye in a big way. Cowboys win 43 to 20. They're five and two. This is a route. Like this game got out of control early. 17 to three after the first quarter. Goodness gracious, Rob, what is going on? It was wild how fast things turned. So the Cowboys and Rams go back and forth. It's 10, seven Cowboys and the Rams get the ball and right on first down Stafford throws a pick six and you're like, Oh my God, Dallas defense doing the job again. Okay. So the Rams get the ball back and they get stopped. It's fourth and 12. Boom. Cowboys block a punt. The ball goes out of the back of the end zone safety. So the Rams have to do the punt after the safety and the Cowboys return it for 63 yards. And two plays later, they score another touchdown. And it's 26 to three in the second quarter. Like talk about quicksand for the Rams. It just completely snowballed out of control for them. Dallas blew their doors off. Yeah. And, you know, Dallas, think about the narrative surrounding them as they headed into the bye week. There were a lot of questions about Dallas and a lot of answers. And then there was the whole report about Aaron Donald going over to the sideline. I don't know if I put too much truth into this saying like, Hey, if you have the money, like come get me like basically <laughs> at the trade deadline, it's like, oh, are we really doing this? But nonetheless, the Rams, their struggles continue. They're three and five. Uh, and yeah, the Cowboys, they're going to be a tough team to beat. Don't you think? 11 straight wins at home for the Cowboys. So particularly if they have to play at home, their defense, I feel like scores more points than anybody else's defense. Not only do they turn you over, but they turn it into actual points when their defense is right. It's as good as anybody. And guess what? Dak Prescott threw another interception in this game. Nobody cares. Cause he also threw four touchdowns. Yes. Like they were, dominant they were throwing the ball they never took their foot off the gas cd lamb 12 catches on 14 targets for 158 yards and two touchdowns dallas always has the potential to be this team but i think one it has to be fueled by the defense setting up the offense and two just the consistency week to week they don't always show it but when they're right they can look as good as they've looked this year look at their wins this year they have had some dominant blow off wins they spanked the Giants 40 to zip in week one. They crushed the Jets 30 to 10 in week two. They crushed the Patriots 38 to three in week four. Like when they're on, they can be great. And they were great on Sunday. You know, I, I think the, the comments you made about the defense is 100% accurate because when the defense is making plays like that, it takes pressure off Dak Prescott. When Dak Prescott has the pressure on him, that's when things tend to go real south real quick. Because I, I just don't buy into him being that big-time quarterback. He can make the plays, but he's not going to go out there, and I just don't feel that he's that guy that's going to win the game. He's not going to go out there and say, hey, this is this is my game. I Defense isn't playing well. Get on my back. That's when he turns into that turnover machine. And we saw that kind of against the 49ers when you were at the game on Sunday Night Football. So The last game the 49ers won, by the way. Yeah, you gotta, I didn't bring that up. You did. By the way, uh, by the way <laughs> Cowboys Eagles next week in Philly. How huge Ooh. is that game? That's going to, was that Sunday night or is that uh, a prime time? No, that's 425. That's the, okay. that's the late game kind of prime time, you know. At least it's a 425. If that was a one yes. o'clock game, like when the Buffalo Bills and the Miami Dolphins played for the first time, like, what are you thinking? In <laughs> like, come on. <laughs> there are All some right. really good games. Sorry to, to derail no, it. Okay. There are some really good games next week. You mentioned Miami and Kansas City. 
that's early, early on Sunday because that's yeah. in Frankfurt, Germany. You've got that game. You've got Dallas and Philly. You've got Buffalo and Cincinnati on Sunday night football. Seattle and Baltimore in the early window is going to be a good game. There are some juicy matchups next week. That, yeah. Well, the, the Steelers play on Thursday night, so my misery will be over before that. So I'll get to enjoy <laughs> those games. This will be good. All right. Speaking of misery, as I always try to segue into the next game, the Vikings win, and you're probably thinking, how is that misery? They beat the Packers 24-10, but they lose Kirk Cousins in the process. Kirk Cousins is, I don't know if this has been verified. I think it's pretty obvious. Ruptured Achilles tendon. His season is likely over. And now all of a sudden, everyone's wondering, are the Vikings going to make a move at the deadline and try to get a quarterback? Because that 24-10 to 10 win, it's a big divisional win. The, the Minnesota Vikings, who were left for dead at one point, have clawed their way back to 500. They're 4-4. Four and four. Rob, what do you think about this situation? Just really strange with the Vikings winning, but then losing Cousins at the same time. I know Viking fans are not going to want to hear this. This is not the worst thing to happen to that organization. It's terrible for Kirk Cousins. I don't want anyone to get hurt. Uh, he was playing the best ball of his career. And he was you know, going to be a free agent after the year. So this kind of complicates things for him. But if you're Minnesota, were you winning the Super Bowl this year? No, you weren't winning the Super Bowl this year. Kirk Cousins was good enough to get this team into the playoffs, but I don't think good enough with that surrounding cast that he had there to win you a Super Bowl. This is a get out of jail free card. Don't trade for Ryan Tannehill, as I've seen some people suggest. Don't do it. Take your medicine the rest of the year. Say, hey, you know what? Unfortunate circumstances. We believe in whoever the hell the backup quarterback is there. And, you know, I think it's a rookie, actually, uh, Jaron Hall. And just say, we're going to take our medicine and see what we got with Jaron Hall. Get the draft pick and figure it out. And move on from the Kirk Cousins era and move into your new era of Viking football. And that's what you got to do. Don't make any dumb trades to try and get a quarterback that's going to keep you, you know, 500 or, or thereabouts. It's not worth it for the Vikings franchise. That might be one of the toughest lessons to hear as a fan. I mean, let's be honest. Like, it's really difficult, but I think it's an important one to understand. Like, sometimes you have to say, like, look, it's just not. Are we winning a Super Bowl this year? Like, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. Look at the Steelers. It's a perfect example. Like you said, Mike Tomlin will get him a nine and eight. What's that get you? A middle of the first round draft pick. You're never getting that guy that is going to be maybe that, you know, transcendent player that could lift the franchise for the next few years. It, it does taking this is some tough medicine to take. We'll put it that way for the Vikings fan base. And who knows? Maybe they'll scrap out some wins, even with a rookie quarterback. But I agree with you. The Vikings might not even win the division and they might not even get in the playoffs. Like if you sell the farm, even if the farm is a third round draft pick next year, there's a lot of value in a third round draft pick. Y yeah, this is going to be tough. And like, it, I never thought about it that way. That was a really good perspective in terms of thinking about it from the long term and not so much for the short term for Vikings fans. And who knows what's going to happen with Kirk Cousins? Will he wind up in San Francisco next year? Oh, that's, that's a, I'm sure it's being talked about. Kyle Shanahan cool. loves him some Kirk Cousins. It's definitely being talked about after the stinker. You know what? I'm I'm grabbing the show. I'm steering the show bright to the 49ers right Do now. Do it. Do it. Brock Purdy was so bad in the second half of this game. Three turnovers, two turnovers in the fourth quarter for the second straight week. He was great in the first half. He was the only good thing about the 49ers in the first half, but he was horrible. In the second half of this game, if you didn't see it, the Bengals are winning because they're just destroying the 49ers defense, but the Niners are still hanging tough. They're still in the game. They are driving down the field at the end of the third quarter. They are at Cincinnati's eight yard line. It's first and goal. And the Niners try to run this option play and, and Purdy keeps the ball. He doesn't hand it off. He's trying to flip it to George Kittle on like a shovel pass, but Kittle's covered up. So Brock Purdy keeps the ball. Well, right then, you can't pass the ball because there are linemen blocking downfield because they think it's a run. You can't throw the ball. Yet Purdy rolls out. Not only does he throw the ball, which is an immediate flag, so the play wouldn't have counted. The ball gets intercepted. It gets tipped and intercepted by a Cincinnati defensive lineman, and that's it. The Niners not get zero points out of it when they could have tied the game. Niners defense forces a punt, which is something they rarely did all day. The next pass by Brock Purdy is intercepted in 49ers territory. Bengals get the ball back. One play, touchdown. That was the end of the game. 
it was a terrible second half for Brock Purdy. And there were a lot of people in the 49ers content community and a lot of people in the Bay Area who were demanding flowers because they knew that Brock Purdy was the next Joe Montana. And he has been bad, bad, bad these past three weeks. So everyone said the same thing about Brock Purdy, whether it was a victory or whatever, is he's a system quarterback. He's a system quarterback. He's a product of a Kyle Shanahan system quarterback. So what, yes, he has been bad. There's no denying that the stats are the stats, but what is going on? Is the system not working or is this just a quarterback that's not getting the job done? I've always described the 49ers under Kyle Shanahan, like a clock when all the parts are functioning the way they are supposed to function. It's an unstoppable machine, but if even one piece of that clock is not functioning the way it should, the whole thing ceases to function. It completely breaks down. And the 49ers cannot control the line of scrimmage on offense. They can't run the ball at all. And so when that happens, they're dependent on their quarterback to lift them up. And no quarterback in the Kyle Shanahan era has ever been able to do that. Whether it was Brian Hoyer, whether it was Jimmy Garoppolo, whether it was Trey Lance, whether it was Brock Purdy, they have never had a guy that can carry the team on their shoulders. And Brock tried in the first half. He was doing all he could. He was using his legs to scramble and pick up yards, which was awesome because that's something that he hadn't done and he had opportunities to do. But when, when it came down to it and they needed to play from their quarterback and they couldn't rely on the run game, Brock couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. And it's incredibly frustrating. And the defense is not playing up to snuff. They allowed 19 straight completions by Joe Burrow in this game. At one point, I was sitting there just praying that they could force one incompletion. Forget a stop. Just one incomplete pass in this game. Niners have a lot of problems going into the bye week. A lot. So are they are they going to go out? Of, there's a lot of talk that they're going to try and move a lot of pieces to get some cornerback help. You bring up the secondary. Are you on board with that? No, because the, the problem is not a lack of talent. It's not that like, oh, we need one more guy. What do we talk about with this 49ers team? Oh, the roster is so loaded, right? They got Nick Bosa and Fred Warner and Teleno Hufanga and Debo and Kittle and McCaffrey. It's not that they need another player. It's that this is fundamentally broken. This scheme is fundamentally broken right now. They're not marrying the coverage on defense with the pass rush. They're, they're rushing a lot of people, but they're playing soft zone coverage, which is making it easier for quarterbacks to complete passes. The, the defensive players are starting to make, you know, kind of veiled comments about that. Kyle Shanahan is openly disgusted as a thing. The problem is not that they don't have talented players or enough talented players. It's what they're doing with the talented players that they have. And oh, by the way, Nick Bosa, feel free to get a damn sack when you're covered up, by the way. I think he's got three and a half sacks in his last like 13 games, including the playoffs. That's not good enough. Not for a guy that just got the freaking bank. Like mm -hmm. they just rolled up the Brinks truck. You want some type of productivity a la like a TJ Watt. TJ yes. Watt gets paid handsomely. TJ Watt impacts games every single week. So, man. I never saw this coming. I will say that you know, the 49ers blew the doors off the Steelers in week one. We saw them dominate teams after that. And I never once, especially after that Dallas game, never did I expect the wheels to completely fall off. No, they're off. They're front runners. When they get a lead, when they come out and get an early lead, they're awesome. Look, go look at all their wins, especially that Cowboys game. They came out right out of the gate. And boom, blew the doors off the Cowboys. When they get behind, they can't come back and win. They have they're I think they're 0 and 37 now in the fourth quarter when they are down by eight or more points. They can't do it under Kyle Shanahan. They cannot do it. And credit to Cincinnati. Joe Burrow looked incredibly healthy in this game. He was scrambling. He was using his legs all the time. They were running stuff under center, which showed that his calf, you know, he had the mobility in the calf. Mm -hmm. They look like the Cincinnati Bengals team of old in this one. So the AFC should be worried. Because if that's the team that the Bengals now are, they can beat anybody. So the Bengals, <clears throat> excuse me, they go on a bye week, correct? Uh, no, they came off their bye this week. Oh, not the Bengals. I'm sorry, the 49ers. The 49ers yes. have a bye this week. And 49ers have a bye it. this week, and they come out of it against Jacksonville, I believe, who's also coming out of a bye week. Interesting. This, this is interesting. I'm looking at the schedule for the 49ers, Jaguars, Buccaneers, Seahawks, Eagles, Seahawks. Cardinals, Ravens, Commanders, and Rams. 
It'll be interesting, man. This is don't give up on the 49ers. They're still a good football team. They're still a good football team, but something's got to change. And I think getting healthy is going to be important as well as hopefully they can do that over the bye week. But let's, let's go on to a game, which I actually didn't even know this game was happening, but it did. The saints beat the Colts 38 to 27. <laughs> Some games you're like, man, I didn't even know the Saints played the Colts, but the Saints put up 38 points. The big knock on them was that they couldn't move the ball offensively. That they weren't able to put up any points. They had just come off a loss on Thursday night football. So they had the little mini bye week as we like to call it. And they find a way to win over Gardner Minshew 38 to 27. The saints are four and four Indianapolis falls to three and five. Any takeaways from this game? This was a mid off. If I ever saw one, I mean, just, the Colts with Gardner Minshew, okay, they're not terrible, but they, I mean, they put up 27 points, but you're no one is shocked that they blew a 10 point lead in this one. They were up 17 to seven in the second quarter. And, you know, the Saints, good on them, I guess, because we saw on Thursday night when Derek uh, Carr threw a pass to, I think it was Chris Olave, and Olave yes. kind of throttled down, and the car was caught on, on the mic saying, What are you doing? Run. Like, they look like there was some dysfunction there. Obviously, they put up 38 points in this one, so good on them. But this is what the Saints are going to be, right? Four and four. Again, this is kind of like the Vikings with Kirk Cousins. They have a quarterback that's good enough to win you some games, but not good enough to get you to where you're competing for a championship. So you're just stuck in this kind of purgatory. Yeah, it's the Saints are the, the, it's the NFC South, man. And the NFC South is like this muddled mess of nothingness it's just weird like there's there's no team like every division like okay afc south let's do the comparison based on direction afc south well you got jacksonville they're six and two like they're a pretty good team they've won five in a row you look at the afc north you've got the baltimore ravens like they're actually doing well you got the nfc north you're looking at the detroit lions nfc south is like what do we have like <laughs> what is going on i don't know Someone's going to win that. Well, what are, what are the standings at actually in that division or in the, in the division right now? Atlanta's four and four, and New Orleans is four and four. They lead the division. Tampa's three and four. Carolina bringing up the rear at one and six. There's going to be some playoff team in the NFC <laughs> that gets to play the NFC South, and it's like just a free pass into the second round. They're they're going to host a playoff game though, right? <laughs> it's like insane. you're going to go on the road. They're going to get the doors blown off their season's going to be over and they're going to try and couch it as a win because they made the playoffs and they won the division and some team is just basically going to get a free pass into round two of the playoffs yeah that's i don't know i don't know let's go to the nfc east the eagles find a way to win i can't believe i've said this. the second game in a row they played the washington commanders the last time they played the commanders commanders took it to overtime we criticized riverboat ron for not being riverboat ron at the time for not going for two and trying to win it 38 to 31 AJ Brown is a freak of nature. That guy just does some of the things that he does are just, you talk about trades and paying off. Like that was worth every single piece of that trade with the Tennessee Titans for Philadelphia. They find a way to win 38 to 31. They keep the foot on the gas They're seven and one Washington moves to three and five is how many times did Sam Howell get sacked? That's the question. One. That oh. was the amazing thing. And it was a crucial <laughs> fact at the end of the game too. Washington's offensive line had held up so well, but unfortunately in a crucial, crucial spot, Sam Howell was the only time he got sacked. Uh, it was fourth and five with two minutes and 13 seconds left. And Sam Howell got sacked. And that basically ended the threat because the Eagles got the ball back and scored three plays later. I keep telling people, like, everybody keeps talking about how, like, well, the Eagles, you know, like, I'm seeing on Twitter. Sure, the Eagles won, but they gave up 31 points to Sam Howell. So what? They won the game. Any type of game you want to play with the Eagles, they can win it. Close game. Shootout. They are the team that I wish the 49ers were. The Eagles seem to be the battle-tested team that doesn't panic, that can find a way in whatever kind of game you need. And by the way, whenever they need a play, they throw it to A.J. Brown, and he delivers every single time. I think it's six straight games with 125 or more receiving yards. It's either five or six. I can't remember off the top of my head. Eight for 130 in this game with two touchdowns. Doesn't matter if it's zone coverage, man coverage, two guys covering him, one guy covering him. He's unbelievable right now. And Philly, I want no part of Philly if I'm in the NFC. They are 7-1. and one. They are well coached. They are aggressive on fourth down. They actually make smart fourth down decisions and they just look 
like the best team in the NFC right now by a wide margin. A game on Sunday is going to be big though for Dallas. That's going to be Dallas. that's going to be huge. That is going to be huge for sure. So the Eagles find a way to win, but like you said, doesn't matter. They found a way to win. A game that now has the NFC West leading Seattle Seahawks beating the Cleveland Browns 24 to 20. The Seahawks are now 5 and 2. And it's just it, I I don't even know what to think about the Seahawks. Like they they're 5 and 2. Yeah, but I think the weirdest five and two team ever. I mean, the Browns with PJ Walker at quarterback, you know, you're an NFC West guy. What are your thoughts on this game? So this was a weird game. The Seahawks are up 17 to seven after the first quarter. And you're like, all right, they're in control of this one. And then all of a sudden the Browns score three times unanswered. They get a Kareem hunt touchdown. They get a couple of field goals to go up 20 to 17 and Seattle has to drive down the field at the end of the game. They end up scoring the go ahead touchdown with 38 seconds left in the game. Credit to, to Pete Carroll and his team. Again, like, don't get caught up with style points. This league is hard. The whole league is designed for every game to end in one score. That's exactly what the NFL is trying to do. So you shouldn't be knocked for winning a one-score game, even if it's against an inferior opponent, because that's how the league is set up. And Seattle made the plays they needed to make at the end of the game to win the game, and they deserve credit. And they have a good offense. Geno Smith can move the ball. He can make some really good throws at times. He can make some weird plays too, but he can make some really, really high level throws and credit to Seattle. And they're five and two right now. And I know as a 49er fan, I am very uncomfortable about just winning the division, let alone anything else beyond that. See, the, the, so this is a situation where, you know, don't you, you want to poo poo the Seahawks defense for giving up 20 to a PJ Walker and Nick Chubb less team. Do it. Putting up 24 points on that defense, the Cleveland Browns defense, mm -hmm. you have to take note of that because their defense is still relatively healthy. They are a very good defensive unit. They had been riding a very hot streak, uh, beating the 49ers. Obviously, they, they went in a wild game against Indianapolis last week. Going to the Northwest is tough. The Browns lose, but the Seahawks find a way to get it done, and those throwback uniforms were just Ah, they're so cool. I love those. <laughs> like, I love those uniforms. They are so awesome. But the Seahawks, again, NFC West leading team. You have to wonder, are they going to be able to keep it going? You take a look at what their schedule looks like. They have the Ravens next week. You mentioned that yeah. in the early time slot. The Commanders are going to be going to the Northwest. Then they have some divisional games before they play the Cowboys. So, hey, they still have the Eagles on their schedule. We'll find out about the Seahawks soon enough for sure. Yeah, they have a stretch week 12. San Francisco, then they go to Dallas, to San Francisco, and then they're home against Philadelphia. So that is a mega stretch for the Seahawks. That's where their season is going to be decided. Yep. And so the Seahawks, though, hey, doing the job, doing the thing. Good for them. Let's go to another NFC West and AFC North matchup with the Baltimore Ravens going out west to the Arizona Cardinals. This game was a hell of a lot closer than I thought it was going to be. 31-24, to 24, the Ravens find a way to win. I think Lamar Jackson is now has only lost one game to an NFC opponent in his entire career. Obviously, he's never been to the Super Bowl, so that doesn't count, but I, you know, not, not like that would play into it. The Ravens are 6-2. and two. Arizona's bad, but they're playing tough. 31-24. to 24. Lamar's stat line was not that impressive, believe it or not. This was a weird game. This was a very weird game because it was 31 to 15 Ravens with two minutes and 51 seconds to go in the entire game. And then all of a sudden, Arizona gets the ball back. They score a touchdown. They get an onside kickback. They kick a field goal. And it finishes, as I said, in a one-score game. But it was actually looking like a very dominant Baltimore win there right up until the like I said 251 in the fourth and the fact that Lamar can have the type of game he had and the Ravens could still put up that many points and be in control of the game like they were that should worry the other teams in the AFC the fact that it doesn't have to be the Lamar Jackson show I mean he only threw for 157 yards and he only ran for 17 yards in the game but when Gus Edwards has three touchdowns on the ground this is what Baltimore can do yeah, and if I'm a Ravens fan, though, the, the performance of Lamar, you just want to see, it's kind of like Josh Allen. We talked about Josh Allen a lot on this podcast as it pertains to the ups and downs, the peaks and valleys. Like, for me, you want to see a little bit more consistent play from Lamar Jackson, and this seemed to be by design. I don't think they were going to expect Lamar to kind of throw the ball 40 times. They didn't stop the run, so therefore they're going to continue to run the ball. Gus Edwards is a good back. 
And the Ravens are a really tough team. And they're a tough team for NFC teams to figure out. And this is something that Bill Cowher said. I think he was on the Pat McAfee show. And they brought up Lamar. He said, look, why is Lamar tough for NFC teams? They don't see anyone that's like him. And the AFC teams, especially the AFC North, like they're so used to preparing for Lamar Jackson that they can stymie what they do because they're so used to it and they're so comfortable with what the Ravens are trying to do. It's tough for an NFC opponent to try in one week's time prepare for Lamar Jackson. He is still a very unique beast, and they find a way to win. The Ravens have firm control over first place in the AFC North at 6-2. and two. Their schedule, when you look at it, Okay, we talked about the Seahawks game. Then they have back-to-back divisional games with Browns and Bengals. And then they go to the Chargers. And then they've got some tougher games down the stretch with down the road 49ers, Dolphins, and Steelers to finish out the regular season. What do you you think like the Ravens are potential AFC contenders? When you have Lamar, yes, because even if you do everything right against Lamar Jackson, he can still make plays, whether through his with his legs or his arm. He can do both now. Um, and that I like you, you talked about why it's tough for NFC teams. It's tough for anybody because yeah. you still have to tackle this guy at the, yeah. at the end of the day. And it's incredible what he can do. So um, do I make them the favorite? No, but there's no game. The Ravens can win where I'm going to sit there and say, I'm stunned because they've got one of the best quarterbacks in the league. The biggest question is not can Lamar Jackson win it is it can even play in those games. He has been injured yep. a lot in the tail ends of the season. He's missed playoff games. He's missed games on the stretch that are crucial. Can they keep him healthy? That's going to be the biggest question as it always is for the Baltimore Ravens. You know, the title of this podcast is what is going on in the NFL? Maybe nothing kind of embodied that one question, like the Broncos beating the chiefs 24 to nine, the first time the Broncos beat the Chiefs since 2015, when I believe Peyton Manning was the quarterback, this was in a, the, from a weather perspective. They had a ton of snow up in uh, Denver. It was really cold. Nothing was going for the Chiefs, only scoring nine points. Rob, what happened? Patrick Mahomes got the flu. That's what happened. He was sick in this game. <laughs> He, uh, he got a stomach bug from his wife and his two kids, which as a father of two kids, I can tell you, yes, your kids are like little incubators for disease, man. When they get sick, you get sick. That's just how it works. Uh, it was not good on the day. 59.2 passer rating, three sacks, two picks. You know, Kansas City's offense has sort of been up and down this year. Um, but like it's bound to happen. They had one. 12 straight against Denver. Mahomes had won 12 straight against Denver. Like that doesn't just continue forever. Eventually you're going to have a clunker like this. You're going to have a game like this and credit to Denver. They did what they needed to do. They won. I mean, I still think they're terrible, but Kansas city is still six and two. They're fine. They're still have a, a nice lead in the division. It's just, this was a speed bump. That's all. Yeah. I don't think anyone's going to hit the panic button here. I mean, yeah, you don't want to lose these divisional games and the Broncos have proven to be pretty bad this season, but yeah, Patrick Mahomes, Hey, if anything, it tells me my gosh, like Patrick Mahomes wasn't feeling well. If this is what you get. Like Travis Kelsey doesn't have a huge game, nine points, Put that guy in bubble wrap, get him away from his family and kids. If it's a big game. Coming up. <laughs> right. Sorry. <laughs> we're going into quarantine <laughs> mode. And you know what? Like we talk about styles make fights all the time too. Denver's defense has held up reasonably well against Mahomes this year. In the first matchup, the Chiefs were one for five in the red zone. Now, they won the game, but they only scored 19 points. And this one, 0 for three inside Denver's 20-yard line. Mm. Sometimes you just, you know, you have bad matchups, and, and Denver's defense has been able to give the Chiefs problems in the red zone. And like you said, they're, they're due. At some point, the Broncos were going to win one of these games, and yep. they're due. You just don't have that type of domination for that long, and it just c- continues to be sustained. Eventually, a team's going to get got, so to speak, and that was the Chiefs in this one. Let's finish this up with Sunday Night Football. The Chargers find a way to win. I shouldn't say find a way to win. This game wasn't really that close. 30-13 to 13 over the Chicago Bears. Can't believe this one was kept in prime time, but it was. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, the, maybe the, the luster of the rookie of Mr. Badgent from – Shepherd <laughs> University, my alma mater is kind of worn off, but hey, Justin Herbert throws for three. What are your thoughts on the Chargers? It's just nice to see the Chargers go out and handle their business for once, right? Like, damn, this is we expected the Chargers to be able to have more games like this. They come out of the shoot in this one, and right away, 
They stop the Bears on the opening possession. Then they go touchdown, touchdown, field goal, touchdown. Those were the Chargers' drives in the first half. And that's exactly what you should do against a garbage team like the Bears. And that seems like the Chargers are never able to do that. They always can't get out of their own way. They finally did in this one, and they look like the team that we thought they could look like. And the Chargers, again, this is all about them because no one expected much from the Bears. But the Chargers, they, they, they're they three and four. And when you think about the Chiefs losing, some might say, well, the door's cracked for them to potentially move up the standings. They have the Jets next week, then the Lions, Packers and Ravens and Patriots in the upcoming slate of games. Not necessarily a murderer's row coming up. Do you think the Chargers could find a way to kind of maybe become more of an AFC presence? No. <laughs> <laughs> the Chargers are going to charge her, right? Like Jets, perfect example next week. They, they'll be moving the ball, but the Jets defense is really, really good. I imagine New York will force a couple turnovers, and it'll be a situation where the Chargers will get the ball back. It'll be like tie, or they'll be down four, something like that, and they'll need a big drive at the end of the game, and they probably will turn it over and not get it done. Like, that's who the Chargers have been. And it's not just the Justin Herbert thing. That's who they were with Phillip Rivers, too. It's amazing that th- it has carried over. They've had really good quarterbacks, and yet they always kind of seem a little bit snake bit. So, yeah, th- I think the Chargers will just be who they have been and maddeningly frustrating. The Jets are getting points. Take the Jets getting points next week. <laughs> I would. Which they, will, they will be getting a lot of points, I would imagine. <laughs> All right, that does it for us. Rob, why don't you tell everyone where they can find you on social media as well as your San Francisco 49ers coverage? So I am on all the socials, at Stats on Fire, Twitter, Facebook, Twitch, or Instagram, wherever you get your socials, I am there. And if you want uh, what I think is the best 49ers coverage in the National Football League, we are the Gold Standard Podcast Network. Just search Gold Standard Network on YouTube or anywhere you get your podcasts, and we will pop right up. We will be grateful uh, for any amount of your time. If you're just looking for the visual, just find the smoke, and that's the gold standard network of the fans that are ready to burn it down. Hey, don't worry. If, like, if you find the dumpster fire, you'll find my coverage of the Pittsburgh Steelers. There you go. <laughs> Gather around. Get warm in the fall. Steel Curtain Network is the name of our coverage. Uh, you can find us anywhere you get your podcast. You can find us on YouTube, just like Rob said. You can find me on social media at Jay Hartman, H-A-R-T-M-A-N underscore P-I-T. It's been another week, Rob. Thanks again for your time. We'll talk next week. Take it easy. Thanks, Jeff.